Hello and welcome to my talk entitled Science, Spirituality and the Transition Out of Modernity Towards a Transmodern Integration of Head and Heart. So the agenda for today's talk is as follows. I'm going to be talking about historical transitions and epochs starting off with the pre-modern to modern transition, the modern to post-modern transition, and the post-modern to trans-modern transition. Inevitably, by endeavoring to relay the key features of these major historical epochs in a short time, there'll be a certain amount of smoothing and simplification, but hopefully you'll find it a useful summary and you can dig in more at your leisure. And then we'll finish talking about the Modi model, which is my model of how science and spirituality relate um, and mentioning how it works within a transmodern paradigm. So off we go. Starting off with the pre-modern worldview. So really what we're talking about here is the medieval world the world prior to the rise of science and the Enlightenment, prior to Romanticism, prior to many of the religious reforms that occurred from the 1600s onwards. So we can imagine here, I'm, I'm trying to relay the features of life, say in um, 15th century Europe, and indeed the rest of the world too. Uh, there'll be a, inevitably a slightly Eurocentric flavor in this talk, but I'll try and minimize that as well. So the pre-modern worldview was one in which religion worked as a unifying framework for lifestyle, norms, knowledge, belief, purpose, and much more. It was very much functioning in the way that its etymology suggests that it should. Uh, ligari means to stick together. Re-ligari means to, to sort of stick back together. And so it was functioning as a ligature, as a sticking system to stick all the features of life, uh, which can become very chaotic and often were in the pre-modern world into some kind of order, some sort of unity. And in so doing, it acted as a buffer against chaos. And it was a world where chaos was a constant threat. Uh, illness was rife. Child and infant mortality was high. Wars were almost constant. There were no police. Violence was a constant threat. Average life expectancy was around 40. It was a hard world to live in. And religion provided a buffer against that hardness, against that difficulty. The unification that it provided, of course, meant that the, the th threat to that unity, threat to religion, was con conceived as an existential threat. And there was a, a huge amount of censorship and certain amount of violence in upholding this unified religious worldview. It was very much, you know, what's, what's the, the, it's, it's the kind of religion that was uh, was that was was upheld was what we would consider to be fairly fundamentalist now the unity of knowledge that was also within the sphere of religion and to a degree under this overlapping sphere of philosophy which was somewhat subordinate to religion but also slightly outside of it insofar as it draw draw on classical antiquity which was sometimes contrary to Christianity, but still there was a huge amount of unity, very little by way of diversity, very little by way of specialization. And you'll see this is a massive change when we move into modernity. So for example, if we look at the medieval university, here we have pictures of Oxford, Bologna and the Sorbonne, all of which were functioning uh, in uh, from around the 12th century onwards. Uh, <clears throat> all instruction was in Latin, and there was very little choice. 
If you were going to do a master's program, you were taught seven subjects, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, music theory, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And once you finish your master's program, you could specialize really in one of three areas law, medicine, or theology, and theology being the most prestigious. This was therefore a world in which generalists in the sense of knowledge were the norm. And this provided the very considerable strength. If you teach people in a way where they have a grasp of many disciplines, then they have a big picture overview, which is very beneficial in a whole variety of ways. But as, as we'll see shortly, once with the onset of modernity, this became increasingly untenable and hyper-specialization became the norm. We'll come back to that shortly. So here again, we have this unspecialized uh, world, which was structured by religion and by a very singular approach to knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge. And that again was based very much on the great figures of the past. So really this was a very scholastic approach focused on the classical philosophers antiquity and of course Christian theology in these three particular universities. And one would have seen uh, a similar array in other centers of learning outside of Europe as well, insofar as it being quite very much structured around the, cent the, the, the cultural, culturally dominant religion and being very past focused as opposed to future focused. So I'm going to describe now how the, the key features of modernity once that it, once it arose and I'll be drawing to a degree on the description of modernity in Ken Wilber's book The Marriage of Sense and Soul uh, but also in another book that will appear via animation in a second and I've got four features here and really it's important to, to emphasize that when you're looking at a transition such as from pre-modern to modern we're talking about a transition that takes at least a century probably two to actually bed down and so one sees it initially in small groups, and then it gradually becomes more dominant and central to, to the culture. So firstly, this, the idea of progress. So the belief that the future can be better than the past and that innovation is the key to that. This was really quite a substantial flip from the pre-modern worldview, which was really under the impression that human uh, society and the world generally was declining in quality over time and that we were gradually uh, moving towards a more broken and sinful state in the future, and that if you wanted truth and uh, if you wanted um, goodness, you had to look to the past, because that's where it was in the lost, this sort of lost golden age, in a, a, an age of higher perfections. Um, and uh, we would, and the best way of managing the future was to minimise change and to hang on to the tra traditions of the past, so you kept this thread from this golden age. A complete flip. What, to, to a new idea to that the, the future may be the, uh, something that we can create anew if we allow individuals, groups to innovate. Progress was really possible. And this was very much fueled by uh, some scientific insights, technological insights that allowed people to see that, that new insights, in, uh, more expansive views than had been achieved by the Plato and Aristotle and so on were really possible. Questioning and individualism and pluralism, questioning the belief that tradition and authority are fallible and can be questioned, and the allowance of that questioning and the allowance of dissent in society was something that occurred slowly, slowly. Gradual removal of censorship, <clears throat> gradual decline in the belief that authority and tradition is the ultimate source of authority, gradual increase in assumptions that individuals can and should have the freedom to experiment to try new things and live in different ways. So pluralism, increasing pluralism, is inherent to the modern experiment, to the modern paradigm. <clears throat> and then crucially, specialization. So separating out, separating out expertise into domains of knowing 
and distinct silos. Increasing uh, specialization as culture got more complex and knowledge got more complex and uh, more and more ideas were germinated and generated as science and other disciplines uh, expanded as art developed in new directions, as music developed in new directions, as culture uh, increased in its internal differentiations and just became more larger, more complex and more varied. And the unifying framework of religion gradually ceded to this, this pluralism and this specialization. Another great book for this is Ancients and Moderns by Richard Foster Jones. It's historically focused, very well written, and it really captures this occurring in 17th century England as a little case study of these changes. And 17th century and 18th century were really the key locus of these changes. Now, I haven't mentioned rationality in science as key to modernity. They were very much part of this process, but it's really important to say that non-scientific movements like romanticism were absolutely key as well. And uh, some religious movements that were emphasizing all of these elements, which I talk about more in my book, Path Between Head and Heart, uh, were really key to this too. So it wasn't just about science and reason and enlightenment. It was about a whole variety of movements religious, artistic, philosophical, poetic, scientific. So what we what emerged in modernity in universities was very different to that pre-modern university indeed, one where there were loads and loads of subjects to study. Here's a sort of short list of things you can study in university <clears throat> from the 20th century onwards. And this was literally the product of this differentiation and specialization over several centuries into new new little pockets of knowledge new areas of expertise and specialism where people could dig down and become an expert in something very specific um, but of course what we're talking about here in terms of individuals who, who go to university and develop their knowledge base is is that actually it's much more specialized than this so let's take psychology for example my discipline Within psychology, of course, there are a, a whole range of subspecialisms. Here's, here's the dis divisions of the American Psychological Association, just to give you a sense of how they divide psychology up. You can have a quick look over those. And if you're gonna do a PhD in psychology, you have to pick w one of these subspecialisms and then dig down within that into a subspecialism of the subspecialism until you're doing something very specific in a very specific area and you have this very narrow expertise the entire system is structured in such a way that it mitigates against general knowledge uh, broad expertise uh, in favor of these very specific um, areas of, of expertise hyper specialization is where we're at People who take a broad overview tend not to be at university. Um, and there's no doubt that education is, some, is, is set up for this uh, special specialization approach. And it's really a major feature of, of life still. Although we'll come back to how the postmodern impulse has changed it slightly. It, and the danger of, of this, even though it's a brilliant solution to a hyper-complex society and a hyper-complex landscape of knowledge where it's simply impossible with the sheer amount of research that's done these days to be an expert in everything. So that so specialization is, is absolutely necessary to some degree, but the problem is beautifully put by this quote, an expert is one who knows more and more about less and less until he knows absolutely everything about nothing. There's a brilliant quote by Nicholas Murray Butler. An expert is one who knows more and more about less and less. It's an almost parodic <clears throat> capturing of the, of, of the paradox of specialization, of knowing of, of, of this digging down into these very specific areas and missing the big picture, which comes with understanding a range of perspectives, a range of disciplines. So what we have in the modern era is silos, individuals, groups based in a particular discipline, a particular 
kind of practical expertise, a particular technical approach to a problem uh, or profession. A uh, really, but of course, we have silos within silos within silos, and this is fundamentally, as was come to in a minute, where postmodernism came in as a, as a movement to try and break down this silo mentality. One thing I want to mention before that is that religion itself became a silo in the modern era. So rather than being, there's my, so you can see religion as a silo rather than as a unifying framework. So rather than religion as a sort of meta structure over all the different disciplines and parts of life, it became something that you would specialize in. You could have you know, religion specialists as opposed to science and the scientific silo or the philosophical silo or the humanities silo and all the sub silos. But religion doesn't really function very well as a silo. Um, it was designed to be a holistic, integrative glue for life, to, to bind all the, all the silos together, all the elements of life together. It can't really work as a silo. Um, and so it gradually changed uh, first into religious societies and mystical movements that were more about a particular kind of inquiry and a particular kind of experience. And then once it had in, the religion had internalized the modern value of pluralism and experimentation and innovation and change, once it had taken those in, it morphed into what we now know as spirituality, which is uh, something which emphasizes awakening, transformation, uh, a, 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 an integration of different ideas rather than the continuity and singularity that was the defining feature of pre-modern religion. And again, there's, a, there's some great books written on uh, how spirituality emerged over the course of the modern era, taking lots of precursors, both religious and pre-religious spiritual movements or cultures, I should say, um, which were not what we would currently consider to be spirituality, whether that's um, well, the, the kind of eco-spiritual and nature cultures, nature spiritual cultures that were defining of, say, the, uh, the Native Americans or elsewhere, uh, these, were in, these were part of a cultural fabric. They were not part of a sort of an eclectic approach to exploring beliefs and experiences, which is the defining approach to modern, postmodern and transmodern spirituality. Let's go on to postmodernism now. Um, postmodern, postmodernism, as emerged in the second half of the 20th century, was a critique of modernity. Um, it was a, a, talked about revealing hidden assumptions, going past um, theories that have become perhaps taken for granted, that we've forgotten where that there, was, there were assumptions there. I think uh, social anthropology is very much about how to reveal assumptions and that was very much caught up in the postmodern impulse it was a discipline that emerged as part of the postmodern critique i would say uh, question the idea of progress and this cultural hubris that's associated with the idea of progress we're bringing progress to you so modernity had lots of shadow sides imperialism uh, predated modernity but it had definitely latched on there's a sort of scientific imperial hybrid about you know well we have a better culture, we're going to give it to you. This is a typical modern hubris. Um, an avoidance of meta theory in postmodernism doesn't like grand narratives and big theories, prefers the local and the specific. Fascination with text and cultural social constructions of narratives within texts. Um, this again was this was really key to postmodernism and it was about again coming away from this idea of objective truth towards how we put together knowledge, understanding, truth, in the way that we frame it through language and argument. Levi Strauss talked about bricolage, uh, which I've, is a term that I've, as I've always had an interest and fascination with this idea of, it's basically this idea of whether it's an art or philosophy of taking things and making a, and sticking a variety of ideas or texts or things or, or, or uh, meaningful concepts together and recombining them in new ways uh, to create something new. So 
bricolage uh, was about this, this idea of the postmodern is to is to see if you can come up with uh, something meaningful and new by recombining by by taking ideas from different places and putting them together in new kind of collages, new ideas, new theories, and interdisciplinary perspectives was part of that. Let's get let's try and get out of our silos and create new connectivity create new um, interconnectedness. But there was a very strong emphasis on deconstruction through the postmodern paradigm. Ultimately, it had this strong emphasis on trying to bring down the silos of modernity uh, and critic, critique, critics of postmodernism, including Ken Wilber, suggest that it was that, that its emphasis on deconstruction at the at the expense of constructing coherent new narratives that drew perhaps on the best of modernity but throughout its worst features was a problem now actually what i my, my view of postmodernity is that in many ways it it was a, it was actually and still is um it simply amplifies some of the features of modernity. For example, pluralism was inherent to modernity from the beginning, and postmodernism post took pluralism through to a sort of extreme conclusion. So it wasn't so much, a new, I don't think it, it was never going to be the new movement to replace the modern. It was more about modernity's gradual critique and eventual sort of red. Uh, rupturing to allow something new and what is that new well I, I appreciate that there will be a whole variety of perspectives on this vast question of what would replace modernity so um, i'm going to try and just stick to facts rather than ideals when we talk about trans modernity so the, the idea of the trans modern is what's appearing now so what is uh, which is fundamentally changing what it means to exist and challenging the modern world. Um, so the key, uh, and I'll be talking uh, briefly about a, a thinker who refers in this way. So I'm I'm drawing on uh, ideas from several philosophers. So what do we know? What do we know? So it's not about it's, you know the ideal trajectory for humanity, but where are we go actually going? Well. We're in a world of radical interconnectedness where there are benefits and dangers to this radical interconnectedness. This interconnectedness is global, but it's also trans-global as well. We're connected in, in a matter of seconds to, to um, signals coming from probes on Mars and beyond, you know, through, through our uh, mastery of the electromagnetic man, magnetic spectrum, we're connected across the world and beyond Benefits are many, including this online conference that we're um, participating. The dangers are many, including pandemics um, and those with nefarious intentions getting into your computer via the internet and uh, defrauding people or creating other dangers. Rebalancing specialization with generalist multidisciplinary perspectives. This started with postmodernism and uh, what I what I see now as an academic is that we're constantly asked to try and take it interdisciplinary perspectives, even though it, it's hard because we, you know we're educated into hyper specialization. But I see this this this, re, this rebalancing now, um, and also a great appetite for big picture thinking. But in the general public as well as in academia some of the top selling books recently such as uh, sapiens are uh, these wonderful broad overview by often non-tenured academics trying to fit all the pieces together systemic constraints as the juggernaut of process progress hits the buffers i've written there so we are coming up as a species against the constraints of our natural habitat. This is evidently apparent through our effect on the natural world in a whole variety of ways. Uh, and we are realizing that progress 
while a crucial value to continue to adhere to to some degree it basically just means that we can do better in the future and we have to believe we can do better but what that better means has changed and what and how that can be allied to a certain arrogance and hubris certain cultural um a sort of and and well, this idea which was probably at its worst in the idea that we could export our cultural values through war, as it were, through uh, occupation and removal of uh, heads of states, which we saw, for example, in the Iraq invasion, this idea that we could simply take our idea of better and progress and just simply plonk it onto somewhere else and go, well, there it is, see? So it, the, the idea of progress, even though it was in, as in the modern era associated with um pluralism shifted to one which was started to be associated with a kind of monolithic quality um and which which uh we we we, we you can see in many of the uh, most difficult episodes of the 20th century as various cultures started to believe in their own superiority and tried to impose them elsewhere and then i've put at the bottom the integration of head and heart essential as a prerequisite of wisdom um, and really uh, what I want to emphasize is that people who discuss tr the transmodern frequently discuss spirituality within its auspices uh, frequently discuss the importance of the transcendent of the mysterious and of that which uh, is the, the cultural vehicle of science has struggled with to some degree because it doesn't because it, it's it, ways of knowing that don't fit with it now i should say that if you look at the modern era and the postmodern era carefully there's been a very strong spiritual impulse through the whole of it it's not been a secularizing period in human existence i don't believe and, we, and i could point to a variety of statistics to support that and you're welcome to ask me questions when it comes to that as well um but this integration of head and heart integration of science and spirituality i believe is key to the transmodern um here is rosa maria rodriguez magda and with her take on what modern postmodern and transmodern is she's a philosopher i put a link at the bottom of this page if you'd like to read her piece transmodernity a new paradigm where she really talks about the interconnected global uh, arrangement of human affairs at the moment. Uh, globalization is, is something which presents many threats, but also in, it is radically changing our existence. Um, indeed, you know, the, the fact of you can see their telepresence being one of the features at the top of transmodernity is certainly a massive feature of the past year for many of us. Presence via technologically mediated means. I'm not going to speak, talk, talk through all these features that she lists. Feel free to pause on this slide and have a nice read through and to get her view of the, of the transmodern. But hopefully you'll see that it, 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 that much of what she discusses, it supports and it, it, it's, it's some directly, somewhat metaphorically, the points that I'm making and will make now as we move on to the Modi model. So this is the model which I've developed as a way of conceiving the relationship between science and spirituality, um, which I believe is suitable as a transmodern framework in that it incorporates many of the features of the transmodern approach. And I'll mention that again shortly. It's fundamentally based on the idea of dialectical thinking and opposites. The other idea that goes all the way back to yin yang philosophy and certain ancient greek views as well that opposites are not contradictory they may be complementary even if two positions are two two points in an argument appear to be at odds they may in fact be two parts of a whole and that this relates to this idea of the interdependence of opposites the interpenetration of opposites and the unity of opposites and just a simple metaphor 
uh, here in terms of light and dark. So light and dark inter are interdependent. You can't have one without the other. They interpenetrate, so you can't find the join between them. And ultimately, they're a unity in that they're a single continuum of shade or brightness. So when you find two antinomies, there's this sort of paradoxical quality about opposites and the continuum that runs between them. Heraclitus called this the palantonos harmonia, the har harmony of stretched opposites. And Jung as well discussed it in relation to his idea of the self and took on many of these ideas in his, his theories. So I'm going to talk through the Modi model now. And uh, it, it's based on the idea that science and spirituality can be, their relationship can be defined by way of seven pairs of opposites. Here they are, inner and outer, personal, impersonal, purposive, mechanistic, ineffable, verbal, explanation, contemplation, empirical, transcendental, and thinking and feeling. Now, these seven opposites, with, uh, when I, I did a, a, a extensive literature review of this field and found that many people Many writers over the past hundred years had looked at this issue and had looked at usually at one, usually at one of these dialectics as a key way of distinguishing science and spirituality. But I wanted to bring them into a into a into a broader, more complex, more integrated, more interconnected view where we can see them all as functioning and as tapping into a broader unity, but also as a, a, a duality within that unity as well. So one could call it a dual aspect monism, a sort of a unity in which there's duality and plurality. So I'm going to briefly describe these seven now for you. And uh, this is taken from a journal article that I'll mention shortly. So inner and outer. So here, so I should say, by the way, that what we're looking at here is not a clear, clear division or distinction but an emphasis where science emphasizes one and spirituality emphasizes the other and there's give and take. So science and uh, outer scientific knowing is based on evidence from the external world gathered via observations or experiments. And it's this recourse to the outer world for its data that gives science replicable and reliable evidence. And for psychology and the social sciences, inner phenomena must be turned into outer phenomena for the purposes of being used as evidence. There's no way around that. And uh, for those of you who apply, uh, 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 work, work in psychology and social science, you can think of how it is that we turn inner phenomena into outer phenomena to then be used as evidence. Inner uh, and spirituality, a central theme within spirituality is the notion of uh, deep within. I actually did a talk for a spiritual organization the other day called Inner Quest, which taps that. Uh, the possibility of knowing things inwardly that cannot be verified publicly. Subjectivity is not being a source of bias in spirituality, but a rich domain of investigation and techniques for refining first person conscious experience. And revealing its deeper contents being key to spiritual practice. So I feel that this is a really important experiential path that, uh, that requires balancing for healthy human functioning. And then we've got impersonal versus personal. <clears throat> so the impersonal being that science aims at an it, excuse me, an I, it, I and it, impersonal account of the world. So I meet it, objects, the impersonal knowing uh, de-emphasizes the observer and their interpretive role it aims to keep subject and object separate, such that an account of the object is not too reliant on a particular point of view or subject. This, uh, this aspiration is a, is a sort of view from nowhere, this idea that you can describe the object without any particular point of view whereas the personal encounter within spirituality is that the idea there is learning to cultivate a sense of i vow connection so me and you uh, encountering the other as a you rather than as it this involves emerging <clears throat> of subject and object or rather subject and subject into a relationship 
This is very different from the distancing of the impersonal encounter. The idea is a meeting and emerging. It's the very essence of relationship. It's the very essence of care. It's the very essence of love, <clears throat> the personal encounter. Then we can go to the thinking and feeling dialectic with science intricately reliant on rational and logical thought at all points of its processes uh, from research questions, hypotheses, designing the studies, collecting data, developing theories, scientists receiving years of training in how to think properly, but they won't have any training in how to feel, even though feeling is often a source of scientific insight. The common value in spirituality, in contrast, is the importance of feeling and then developing the capacity for certain kinds of feeling, including intuition, gut feelings, Gnostic forms of knowing that can deepen awareness beyond verbalized thought. And a key goal being lessening suffering through particular kinds of negative feeling like fear, anger and sorrow being absolutely central to the spiritual path. <clears throat> also developing a capacity for equanimity. So there's a huge emphasis on feeling in spirituality, not to say there isn't an emphasis on thinking as well, but I do believe it's an important counterbalance. And we can see the historical origins of both th th over many centuries in terms of this emphasis on thinking and feeling. Then let's take a look at the dialectic empirical transcendental. Science requires all of its knowledge to come through the senses, all the instruments that, uh, of science that extend the senses, um, but really ultimately everything has to come in, usually through vision. Vision is the primary sense for science. Um, Whereas in spirituality, there's this strong emphasis on this idea of the, of the transcendental, that which extends beyond the empirical, what, whatever that might mean. You know, the, the practices for extending consciousness into areas which seem to be non-sensory. I guess in Wilbur's term, he talks about the eye of the spirit as opposed to the eye of the flesh, this idea of some aspect of our consciousness that can connect with the, with whatever may be beyond again this is not inherent to all spirituality but it's a common focus for many through meditation prayer channeling mediumship divination visions uh, psychedelics whatever it might be uh, verbal ineffable looking at that dialectic science is strung up in language the language of words and maths no matter what you're doing scientifically if you want it to go into the corpus of scientific knowledge it has to end up as a journal article or something similar. Um, so it is a very verbally mediated form of knowing, it comes through the strictures of language. And while in uh, the postmon emphasis was really fascinated by text as well, for me, the, the key feature of spirituality and mysticism as well is this idea of it cultivating experiences that move the consciousness and knowing beyond language, beyond purely verbalized thought. And we see this through various means of cultivating silence, quietening the mind, but also in other means of knowing through art, music, and so on. So we've got two more paths, mechanism and purpose. This was famously discussed in terms of how and why. Science being focused on the how, spirituality more on the ultimate why. So, uh, Mechanism, the mechanistic fo focus of science is really this idea of efficient causality in Aristotelian terms. When you're looking how something happens, looking at the efficient causal process of how A leads to B leads to C. Uh, and this is generally science preferred mode of making sense of phenomena. It not, doesn't avoid the word why, but it tends to see, see even why through a kind of how lens. <laughs> Whereas spirituality tends uh, to a fascination with the idea of why are we here? This idea of well, why did you do that is more of you know, this idea of a, the purpose is explanatory. Looking at divination, destiny, fortune, uh, practices that explore feeling called, you know, vocation, the sense of calling, uh, this idea that purpose might be inherent or be difficult for science to grasp, but they're within us and beyond us nonetheless. And then finally, explanation versus contemplation um, explanation seeking to find the cause or reasons for phenomena by looking past them uh, into 
what may have caused it in the past, what governing law may control it, what other examples of this phenomena could help to make sense of it. The mind spreads away from what you're trying to pay attention to through an explanation, and, and even the meaning of explanation means to spread out, explano. Whereas contemplation is about holding attention fully within the being or object in front of you on the premise that it might hold its own truth if you can connect with it completely, uh, can merge with it, can uh, become one with it in some sense. And so, you know, these two ways of trying to encounter or make sense of something, try for something to reveal its truth, they do tend to be intention because more of one means less of the other to some degree. So these seven uh, axes to me capture a latent duality, a latent unity as well. Um, and they interact a lot. And we see, and I, I refer to an interface space where science and spirituality merge. And we can see a variety of sort of mind focused disciplines that uh, for me capture this sort of interface space. And this includes transpersonal psychology, parapsychology, psychotherapy, noetic sciences, mind body medicine, psychedelic science, consciousness studies, contemplative science, all of these areas which have emerged quite recently in, ter in terms of their, uh, and have developed uh, uh, in ways which combine the values of science with the values of spirituality and look to make interesting new hybrids that marry the benefits of both science and spirituality. Now, this merging is a problem for some people. Some people prefer their science and spirituality separate. They prefer to, for science to keep its strength, uh, its natural abode, by, by sticking to its natural abode, and for spirituality to keep its strengths by sticking, sticking to its uh, emphasis on the right of that diagram. Um, and I entirely understand that viewpoint, but in a deeply interconnected world where all silos are breaking down, these, this, this merging of the two in, in some areas is important, uh, beneficial insofar as it leads to insights that occur when you take an interdisciplinary perspective, but also on an individual level uh, by engaging with practices that allow for a balancing of the two sides of the diagram. People, uh, individuals um, and groups, but at an individual level, people can experience the wisdom that comes from the balancing of head knowing and heart knowing, of the scientific and the spiritual, of the rational and the romantic. <clears throat> so I see this diagram as fitting onto other well-known dualities in psychology, neuroscience and spirituality. It fits with a Ian McGilchrist's account of the left and the right hemispheres in the brain to a large degree. It fits with the ancient alchemical ideas of these two archetypes of salt and lunar or yang and yin in Chinese philosophy. And it also taps onto, or at least echoes, distinctions in cognitive psychology between ways of knowing. Um, separate knowing versus connected knowing, analytical versus intuitive and propositional versus implicational. <clears throat> to me, this suggests that perhaps this duality, which is also a unity, that's why I call it dual aspect monism, is something which finds an expression in lots of different ways, uh, it, because it's so inherent to the human condition, so inherent to who, to who we are and what we do so important as a source of balance that we see it in manifesting in different ways. Now, my view is that the, mod, the Modi model has features of transmodernity. It features this idea of a nexus of radical interconnectedness, that there, are, that there is both many and one simultaneously. That it's this idea of the opposites being paradoxical. They're distinct, yet they're merging. They're dual, yet they're unified. This idea that you can have the many and the one are not contradictory, that they are in fact perfectly complementary. 
that there is integrated diversity. And I, I also mention uh, uh, when I talk about this model in extensively in my book um, that we, we mustn't throw the beneficial features of modernity out. We need to critique them, but not remove them. We need a critical realism, one which critiques the realistic, the realist foundations of, of much of the modern enterprise that understands that we can have multiple interpretations of that reality, but there is a unified ground nonetheless. It isn't just the play of the trace. It isn't just texts overlapping. It isn't, there isn't just a, a nihilistic relativism. This is the journal article, which I mentioned to you, which uh, if you want to read particularly about the parallels between the model and the other approaches I mentioned in the tables, um, the neuroscientific, psychological and spiritual parallels, and a summary of the model more generally, you can find it here. This is uh, in, in the journal for the study of spirituality and for a more extensive exposition of the model and the history uh, and the potential implications that I see, I recommend the, my book, Pass Between Head and Heart. Um, thanks so much for listening and I look forward to uh, discussing this with you live soon.